Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you most people have heard of phytoestrogens but did you know there are beneficial phytoandrogens that mimic and support testosterone and more the top source of these is pine pollen if you're looking for 100 percent natural hormonal support for men and women you've got to try this right now Lost Empire Herbs' best-selling pine pollen is available for one penny plus shipping and handling. Go to GeniusPollen.com to find out more and grab yourself a bag today. No hidden charges, no trial offer, no shenanigans. Just a low-cost way to try Lost Empire Herbs' top product for next to nothing. Forget frequently asked questions. Common sense. Common knowledge. Or Google. How about advice from a real genius? 95% of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed. 5% go above and beyond. They become very good at what they do. But only 0.1% a real genius. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Omar Mo. He's the founder and CEO of NomadCast. Uh, just a uh, full disclosure, I, you know, Omar helps me with uh, all my podcasts and he does a really great job. So I invited him on because I think other listeners would benefit from hearing from him and what he does. So Omar, thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me on, RJ. Yeah, tell me a bit about your background. How did you get into uh, helping out podcasts? It's interesting. So before I got to where I am now, and I mean, I've had this business now for three and a half years, I started off as a digital nomad. So I graduated out of all things with a geology degree about six years ago now, you would say, and realized there's only so much that you can say about a rock. So got really mm -hmm. bored and decided I wanted to go travel. And I went halfway across the world to Australia, stayed there for a year, stayed in New Zealand after that for a year, went to Southeast Asia for about six months. And throughout my travels, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but in some circular way, I realized what I really wanted to do was have freedom to be able to go wherever I wanted at any time. And uh, through that, I met some people that were remote workers, had remote jobs, etc., and uh, kind of dove into that world. And eventually, I started my own podcast. This is my first iteration. Of my podcast was about three, three and a half years ago. I was thinking I would just interview people that travel quite a bit and remote workers and just kind of learn about their lifestyle and see how I can get into it myself. At first, I was listening to this guy named Gary Vee. I'm sure everybody knows him at this point. And if you don't, he's this massive social media guy who just talks about business constantly all the time, but at very surface levels. Mm. And one of the things that he spoke about was to start a podcast, right? So I kind of took his advice, started a podcast, started interviewing people that I thought would be where I, I'd like to be. And eventually, I think at episode 40 or so of that first podcast, I met a guy named Michael. And this kid was making, he was like in Thailand at the time. This was like uh, pre-COVID, Thailand at the time. And he was making, as a 21-year-old kid, somewhere close to 100K a month. And to me, somebody who was going to be a geologist as his life path originally, this kind of blew my mind, right? I was like, how are you traveling and making that much amount of money? Yeah, well, he, it's amazing. It's amazing. At 21 as well. So I asked him, and he's, he said he had his own agency, his own marketing agency. And spoke to him. I ended up giving him, I think, about a 1000 bucks for mentorship. And we dove into things that I like, things that I'm good at. And podcasting kind of became the thing that I was already doing and I want to learn more about it. And I like audio as a form of content more than really any other form of content. And 
so I dove into that world. And from that, I dove into social media and uh, started getting my first few clients. And it grew and it grew. Started getting better, researching the smallest things, what makes the smallest differences, trying to become like pretty much the top 1% in the podcasting slash social media world. And as that happened, my words, the word spread. I started getting referral clients, started getting more clients and just grew. Today, we get more business really that we can handle sometimes. Got a team of 11 behind me and we are where we are now. Yeah, no, that's excellent. So what did you choose to do to help people with their podcasts? Like, what was your first gig like? So so right off the bat, my first podcast ever was with an insurance company, that the entire insurance company caters to nomads, right? And I was I already had a podcast that was nomadic, and they were like, well, why don't you help us with your podcast? With, with our podcast. And what I did originally from them was a whole nine yards, right? Edited, transcribed, email. I, I had researched all the stuff that transcriptions for SEO purposes were great on websites. I I bought courses. I'd read books. I'd done all these different things that tell you, for example, the speak pipe episodes I'm doing right now, all these different elbow grease strategies that we do for people all came from different sources, from top podcasters, from books, from online courses that I've taken. And uh, one of our original strategies was Basically, what we would do for the client was edit, transcribe the podcast episode to make sure the transcription ends up on their website so they get more organic traffic that way. Uh, repurpose the podcast episodes for social content so we grow all their socials that way and drive traffic back to the podcast that way. Write email templates out for them so because they already had an email list as an insurance company that could send out as an email blast for every single podcast episode that was released. And that drove a ton of traffic that way. And that really hacked up the numbers really quickly from a new podcast to something that was getting about a thousand, a thousand five hundred downloads per episode. And that was that was within the first six months or so. And for a new podcast, that's a pretty big deal, right? Like at a podcast of your stature right now, it's not that big of a deal to get fifteen hundred more downloads extra per month. But when you start off, especially grinding those first year or two, those getting hitting those numbers quickly is quite crucial. Yeah, no, that's impressive. We've been uh, for any listeners that want to know, we've been grinding. This October will be the start of the fifth year of the uh, Finding Genius podcast. It used to be Future Tech podcast, but we've been grinding for a long time. But yeah, Omar has been helping us big time. So yeah, you're right. For, to go from zero to over a thousand listens per episode, what are, what are some industry numbers? You know, people always say this. I would guess most podcasts fail or don't continue oh, yeah. after X episodes. Like, what have you seen? I mean, so any podcast that ends up with us, I mean, it's going to continue, right? Because they've already made the financial and time commitment to work with us, which means they're quite serious about it. And hence why we tend to work with businesses. But industry numbers in general, and you have a lot of people by themselves starting podcasts. You have people that maybe started with their spouse or a friend or somebody else. About 80% of podcasts pretty much stop podcasting after the 12th episode. So before 12 episodes, 80% of podcasts are already off the map. The 20% that continue on from there, they carry on, and at some point, they'll start hitting numbers if they're consistent around two years, if they don't use any marketing strategies or anything else on the side. After about two years, if they made it to the two-year mark and they continue from there, they'll probably continue on for a long time. So the ones that, that stay for a couple of years, you know, what level do they get to? I know everyone's different, but um, is there a middle level, like a middle class level of podcasts where they hang out in a certain range? And then, you know, who makes it to the really high levels and what does that look like? Sure. So I've noticed a few different things here, right? So I work with podcasts that are super niche and podcasts that aren't that niche, right? I would say your podcast is somewhere between there being very, very niche and also not super niche because you do have a wide variety of guests. Other podcasts I've worked with that are super niche cater to maybe just marketing business owners or just franchisees or any of these. Now, those kind of super niche podcasts will never really hit those high numbers, whereas more var variable podcasts are going to hit those higher numbers, but they're going to take a little bit longer time to hit higher numbers than super niche podcasts will. Also, when you come to sponsorships, a smaller niche podcast will get sponsors way earlier on than more variable general podcasts simply because they know exactly what kind of sponsor they need. Whereas a general variable podcast will probably have sponsors that are a bit more, let me just throw something in the crap shoot and see what sticks. Now, Let's say, let's take super niche podcast A that I work with that caters to just business owners, right? They've been around for 12 years and they're hitting 50 to 60,000 a month. And uh, to them, they're niche. And that's a really good thing that, that makes them one of the best in the field. They're on blog articles and this is the top 10 podcasts in this niche. Like they're in, they've really owned that niche. Take, for example, a general podcast that I work with. 
that uh, caters to more men than women, but it's super general. That hits somewhere around a million downloads a month or so, 1.2 million downloads a month. And they've built their brand on, they have an in-person studio. They built their brand from the ground up. They have a social strategy across all socials. They got like 500,000 followers on Instagram. All that kind of feeds into it. They're a bit more general. And that's how they, and they've only had their brand for about maybe four years, right? So all these factors come into play. There's no like middle ground anyone hangs out with. Even your niche, sponsors might be more attracted to you at different levels versus another niche, right? So if you took a super specific niche, like podcast specifically for franchises, your sponsors might be really attracted to you at like 2,000 downloads an episode versus like something like Joe Rogan, whose sponsors might be attracted to him after 50,000 downloads an episode. Does that make sense? Most supplements are taken on faith and can take weeks or months to have an effect. Even supplements backed by scientific studies may or may not deliver those same benefits to you. But what if you could feel the results of what you took within just a few days? Lost Empire Herbs offers the highest quality, wild-harvested, non-irradiated pine pollen, and that can dramatically impact your hormones fast. Right now, you can grab it for one cent, plus shipping and handling, at GeniusPollen.com. Yeah, no, that, no, that makes sense. Well, going back, you mentioned the speak pipe episode. So I just wanted you to highlight that for a moment. You know, for the audience, um, we've just finished our second speak pipe episode. You know, Omar came up with this. So can you describe it, Omar? What does it do and how does it work? Sure. So I can't take full credit for this strategy. I got this strategy from an online course that I took a while back. That It was a very small online course, kind of by a not that well-known podcaster, but who had helped a lot of podcasters as well. And the strategy is basically this. You look for Facebook groups. Well, first, you figure out a question that fits with your podcast, right? It can be a question that you possibly ask a lot of people that come on your show. So, for example, let's say you're a finance podcast, and right now there's a recession happening, You might, or a possible recession. You might constantly ask, or every one of your podcast that, guests that come on the show, how are you going to survive this upcoming recession? Then what you do is you want to go on this website called speakpipe.com and set up a SpeakPipe subscription. It's usually $15 a month or so, and you only need it for a month or two or three, depending on how many speak pipe episodes you want to do. By the way, I suggest not doing these more than quarterly. If you have a daily show, it's a little bit different, but if you have a monthly show or four episodes a month, then you should do it just the quarterly max because you don't want your audience to get tired of it. Essentially, you go on speakpipe.com, put this question up, and buy the subscription. Then what you want to do is you want to go on Facebook, Look at Facebook groups that have good engagement in their posts and have 10,000 plus members that fit that specific niche. What you want to do then is reach out to the admins of those Facebook groups, the creators and founders of those Facebook groups, and word it in a way where you say, hey, I noticed that you're the founder of such and such Facebook group. You're an industry leader. We consider you an industry leader in in the finance space. We'd love to have your input and voice heard on our podcast. If you're interested, I can shoot over some details. About 50% of the time to 30 to 50% of the time, they'll come back and say, yes, we're interested, or, or at least shoot me over the details. Then you shoot them over, shoot them over the details about the SpeakPipe episode and the way it's structured and where they go in to record a snippet on SpeakPipe.com. These snippets are up to only five minutes long. And what you'll find is about maybe about 50 to 60% of people after that will fall off because they were expecting an in-person interview or an interview, a one-on-one -on -one interview instead of a speak pipe interview. But the ones that stay also realize the, the value of this, and they'll go in, record a snippet, and you'll get the snippet sent to your email, and it'd be like an MP3 file of however long that they made the snippet for. And then you put together five of those snippets to seven of those snippets, put it together on an episode, host over the episode, and upload it. Then once the episode's released, you go back to the Facebook admins and say, hey, your episode was released. Thank you so much for sharing your insight. Would you mind sharing this with their Facebook group? It'll add credibility for you as well. You reach out back to them. They'll, like nine times out of ten, put it back on their Facebook group and because it gives them credibility as well. And because the admin posted on, the, on their own Facebook group instead of just a member, a lot more people in that Facebook group get to see it, which drives a ton of traffic back to your podcast. Yeah, the end result from what I've seen is that, right, people will listen to an episode, you know, what should you do in a recession? They'll hear from person one, then two, three, four, five. So they get, the, you know, a sampling from industry leaders on their answer to a question. And then the promotion comes from each of those people that contributed, you know, also uh, pushing it out to their list. So I thought it was a really cool thing that you did. That's why I wanted you to mention it to the audience. 
Definitely. Yeah. It's just, it's an elbow grease strategy as I like to call it, right? Podcasts don't have algorithms per se. So you have to do a lot of elbow grease things to drive people back to your platform and paid ads generally don't work that well, right? Like Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Google ads, even simply because the targeting there isn't precise. You can't just target people that listen to podcasts versus people that don't listen to podcasts. You might be able to target people that have the app Spotify downloaded or Apple Podcasts downloaded or, or even iPhone users. But let's say you show the podcast in front of 100 people using a paid ad on a social media platform. Maybe 10 of them listen to podcasts. Maybe a smaller percentage of that are driven back to your own podcast. So it's better to use a organic strategies on social media and paid ads on podcasting platforms to be able to do this. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations uh, to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems uh, because I've seen them explode recently after the, uh, you know, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously. Give us a thumbs up. And check in the description for Buy Me a Coffee. It's about five bucks. If you could buy me a coffee, I'd really appreciate it. It would help keep the channel going, and I love coffee. Thank you. Hmm. Yeah, one other cool thing I saw that we haven't done yet I was going to tell you about is I saw these these two guys have a YouTube channel, two different people. So they did an interview. They did the first half of the interview on Person A's channel, and they said, oh, go to Person B's channel for the second half. So I did that, and I listened to the second half because I wanted to. And then sure. Person B's channel was interesting. So I signed up for Person B's channel. So I thought that was a cool binary strategy. I, guess. I like that. Idea. Definitely a great way to grow two channels simultaneously. That's a good idea. Yeah. So what's, um, what do you see are some of the big challenges that people have? Like what, what are their goals, first of all? Do they, do they just want to get raw numbers of listeners and they think that's success? Do they want money and that's success? Like what are the goals you see from your clients? Uh, it really varies, but I would I would say the goals fit in these major camps. Some of them want sponsorship money, so the bigger they get, the more sponsors they get, or the more the bigger they get, the bigger they get on YouTube, which means they get more revenue money directly from YouTube. Social media platforms are also starting to offer money on their platforms as well, like TikTok offers pay per view. So usually it's a direct revenue source or from sponsors. That's one of the goals. Another one is to leverage the podcast as a mid funnel thing. For example, something that some of my clients do is use the podcast as an ABM strategy, right? One of them is a, I'll talk about the French, one of the franchise podcasts that I work with, and I work with two of them. What he does is if there's interest on either social media or from his email list, someone that possibly wants to look into franchising, he'll bring them on the podcast and then use the podcast as a sort of consultation to be able to interview this person uh give him some consultation on how franchises work, get some questions out of him. And then from there, use that as mid funnel to move them to the last step of the funnel to where they'll probably hop on a call one on one and see if you can close them that way. We've got another client that uses it simply as a brand awareness strategy, he takes all the content from the podcast that, that he makes or we make for him. And then we repurpose all that content and throw it across like 10 to 15 different social media platforms and just keep nailing paid ads on every single one of those pieces of content just for brand awareness. He doesn't necessarily care about the numbers on it. Um, and uh, got another client that just uses it solely for social media content. So they record video. They don't really care about their podcast numbers specifically. They care more about their social media numbers. Goals can vary, but either it's for traffic, for brand awareness, or for for money. Mm, okay. Or gotcha. for clients. Oh, okay. So have you seen that some podcasts lead to, like, I don't know, let's say someone's a consultant, you know, for a given industry. They consult with, uh, you know, IT companies. Have sure. you seen people create a podcast and then actually get jobs from doing podcasts in that industry? Oh, definitely. Um they, the consult, so I used to work with this consultant that was an ex Warren Buffett CEO. And we started his podcast, went on for the last seven, eight months. He's continuing to go on there. I work with another one of his clients now. What he used it for was a few different things. One, he used it for lead generation through 
the content that he created from it from his socials. So he put calendar link in the bio, and then whenever any one of his Instagram posts, TikTok posts, YouTube posts hit, there would be a call to action at the end of these videos, and they would drive traffic to the link in the bio to be able to book a meeting with him for a consultation or something as a first step in the funnel of, of closing the deal. Another thing that he did was whenever there was interest, from anybody that would like to work with him, but they weren't certain about working with him, he'd bring them on the podcast, answer a few questions that way, and that would help push them over the line sometimes. Another thing that he did was just the professionalness professionalness of his podcast and the way that it was set up and the way it was branded. He was using that as painting himself as an authority figure on LinkedIn where he had a really big presence. And we'd use things like Lempod or other things to really drive up the engagement on his content on LinkedIn. And the clients would reach out to him via DM on LinkedIn and want to work with him that way. So, uh, and, and because of the fact that he was an ex Warren Buffett CEO, we really nailed on that fact and that helped him get clients via the podcast and social media channels. So really it's more like a machine that you can use in a lot of different ways, the podcast, including bringing in clients or being at some part of the funnel that gets you clients. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I just wanted people to see all the different possibilities. You don't have to run a podcast just for ad money. And you can run it for notoriety to help yourself get jobs. A couple of things I would add is if there's an industry that you want to learn about, but you're not in that industry, there's really nothing better than interviewing 5, 10, 20, 50 people in the industry. Um, there's certain series I've done where I've interviewed 100 people in an industry like cancer. And once you get to that point, you really get to know a lot of the players in it. You get to make friends. I've had some, I've, I've met some mentors and friends through the podcast and, uh, people that I can converse with, you know, I've traveled and visited some of the people in person. Uh, it's been just fantastic for all these experiences. So it may not just only be about money. It may not only be about positioning, but, um, you know, learning, socializing, uh, maybe even changing careers. A podcast can do that for you as well. I've seen. Absolutely. I think that's, that's really a great way. That's really how I kind of got my start, right? I started podcasting people that were working remote jobs or doing things that gave them time and locational freedom and i eventually stumbled upon what i do you know? so i think it's an excellent way of really just getting more knowledge about any industry or any direction that you want to go in your life yeah what i've noticed too is after you have a presence and it's built up to a certain level sometimes you get really high-end people that would never normally talk to you but they do because they're going to be on your podcast mm-hmm. so like for you omar just you know um you know you're a digital nomad i was able to interview andrew henderson you know the head of uh, nomad capitalist on youtube he's a pretty big guy but yeah. I got him because because of the platform, you know. So why not? Right. Yeah. yeah. He's, I've I've listened to a lot of his stuff. Smart man. Yeah. So I just wanted to convey all the benefits that I've seen, you know, from doing the podcast, uh, learning, etc. Um. So okay. So who would be a good client for you, and who's let's say not ready or doesn't have the goal, the right goals? Like who are you looking for? So let's start with who's not ready. Someone that just started their podcast. Definitely needs to put in some sweat equity before they work with us. We're the person that takes your podcast after it's already grown a little, or at least you brought some consistency into it. And we take it and automate everything and take everything off your hands. But you have to know that you can do these things before you hand them off to us. Number one and number two, either or you're a someone that has a business and they want to start a podcast or they want to explore what a podcast is about or how they want to learn how they can use a podcast for their own business to drive in clients or leads or revenue or whatever other goals they have for their business. We generally only work with podcasters, with businesses behind what they do, or businesses that are curious about starting a podcast. If you're someone that's outside of that realm, and uh, let's say you're like a solo podcaster, because we do work with some solo podcasters that don't have businesses behind what they do, Really, generally, you want to put in the sweat equity of starting a podcast, and you don't want to use us for that because that would just be a waste of your money. You want to start your own podcast, get it to somewhere that's decent enough to where now you want to outsource all the time that it's taking to grow your podcast and edit your podcast, and that's when you could reach out to us as well. Okay. Is there? Um, it's okay if someone's starting, but they have the right intent, or again, do they need to be a certain point along in their development or have enough? I guess they have to have enough money, obviously, to hire you because you do good work. But beyond that, if they do have some money, but let's say they're just starting out, would you still work with them? We'd still work with them if, 
I mean, we take it as, as a case by case basis, right? We still work with them if they definitely have a business behind what they do and the intent behind the podcast is to grow their business. So they feel like they're getting something. But we also work with people that, I mean, I've had a client before that just wanted to start a podcast for the sake of starting a podcast. And they really just had a ton of time in their hands and a ton of money on their hands and just want to kind of test it out. So they use us to help launch their podcast and edit their podcast and all that stuff. So they could just do the content side of it, just the interviews. Um, we take it as a case by case basis, but generally, like 99% of my clients fit that have a business and either wanted to start a podcast or already had a podcast and wanted us to take over. Mm, okay. Yeah. Where do you see the podcasting industry going and where do you want to place yourself? Like, where are you going with this? I see. So Web3 is still very, I mean, it's it's not fully implemented by any means on a day-to-day -day basis in the world, but I see podcasting right now. A lot of people are focused on, or realize that in-person podcasts or podcast studios are really great ways of creating content and that Zoom podcasts as great as they were during COVID, in-person podcasts tend to be more engaging for people to watch and listen to. So I see with Web3 coming out, perhaps there'll be virtual rooms where people do podcasts and you have your avatar and their avatar right in front of each other and you're doing and you're recording a podcast that way. I see that being an interesting field. I see myself continuing down I mean, there's new there's new podcast platforms that come out all the time. There's new social media channels that come out all the time. Really just doing what I'm doing in different spaces. And the position that I want to really hold for myself is, I mean, I want to be the podcast guy, right? That's that's what people refer to me as now. I have a podcast guy. Let me hook you up. I have a podcast guy here. This guy can help you out. And I, I'm synonymous with that name, at least within my referral network. So I want to continue going down that direction to see. If I can be that same kind of person 10, 15 years down the road, I have no plans of becoming ever social media famous or using fame or anything. I like my lead generation tactics now. I never, I have no plans of trying to become world known, but I want to be known as an expert within the field. That's for sure. Um, one thing that we've talked about, um, you know, I do, usually do them all in my interviews audio, and I know there are a lot of people that do video. I've tried some. I just for me personally, I actually don't like it. I have to sit there and like look at the person the whole time, and for me, it doesn't work as well. Sure. But but you did tell me, and you know, we are telling the audience that you've seen that that video podcasts seem to do a lot better than just audio. Is that correct? Right. The, the, with with your videos, we use a lot of elbow grease side strategies, right? That we learned from TikTok. Actually, something we're experimenting with right now is, for example, doing half screen of B roll and half screen of viral videos that have already been proven to have been viral before, and that's helped us get more views on your videos. But what I've noticed. Is I mean I had a client recently that just went from Zoom Zoom podcast to in person studio podcast and she's already doing twice as well as she was doing before, right? Wow. Not to say that both won't grow, but she's just growing as twice as fast as she was growing before, right? Her reels are hitting every single time. Her in person podcast is just much more engaging when you see a face and there's high quality video and you see get to, get to see their facial expressions and you want to watch them as well as listen to them, right? It's, it's just much more engaging. Yeah. No, that's true. So there's audio only, there's video, and then there's also in-person, which is probably the highest level that I've seen. I've also seen another high level where people will set up a studio, big desk and screen behind them. And, you know, these are like really high-end podcasts. Um, but, um, you know, they're they're video in a sense, but they're more like, again, like you'd watch a nightly news program. So have you seen both of those work well or is one better than I, the other? I've seen those work as well. I've seen, I've seen some variations of that too. I've seen a, a couple that does a podcast and they've set up a studio in their place and then they have a green screen frame behind them that the guest's face is on. So you can tell the guest's face is all staticky, but you can see them clearly because they're using HD cameras for their desk setup. So that works well. It's kind of a way around doing an in-person podcast and flying people down to you. Another thing that I've seen is that studio setup, like you said there, like a nightly show style. One of my clients, which is an automotive company in the western side of the U.S., they have that set up in one of their offices, and they use that kind of like a news desk and go in, and that performs really, really well. Uh, I mean, look at Trevor Noah. Right. Or any one of these night show hosts, Jay Leno, like any one of these night show hosts, look how, look how many people come and watch them talk for about an hour. If you could get that sort of vibe going and that sort of setup going with your podcast on YouTube uh, and YouTube just being another distribution channel like television, I mean, it'll perform very, very well if you have the personality for it. And then last question, uh, which channels have you seen work well and which ones are kind of like, eh? And, you know, it may depend on the, the podcast type, but what are some things you've noticed about the channels that are good 
the podcast versus just mediocre? I mean, my four favorite, more my four that I think work generally with every podcast is Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, and LinkedIn. LinkedIn more so for podcasts that have businesses behind what they do as well. And if you don't have a business behind your podcast, or if it's not the podcast isn't using isn't being used to feed into the business, then LinkedIn doesn't nearly matter as much. Also, for certain niches, especially at higher levels, especially if you're if you're at a higher level podcast and you have guests that are coming in that are high level guests, I find Twitter to be a very interesting platform. You can repurpose content from your podcast for Twitter, but the main thing about Twitter is once you've built some brand equity with your podcast and grown it to a certain level, people know your name because you've either had them on an interview or perhaps your name has been spread around because you had one person on an interview and he told his friends about it or whatever. You can start engaging in high-level conversations with high-level people on Twitter that have thousands, if not millions, of followers because of, a, of having a massive podcast behind behind your stuff or behind your brand. I wouldn't suggest using Twitter as a content platform. I would suggest using it as more of a conversation-based platform. But anyone that has a massive platform behind their brand will find a lot of benefit from Twitter. Pinterest, Pinterest is something we're kind of experimenting with at the moment. I think it's much better for e-commerce products than anything else. So if you have an e-commerce podcast or an e-commerce product podcast or podcast used to fuel, fuel any of your product sales, it can be useful there, but it's not, I don't find that much use from it yet. I find it as another cross-posting opportunity, just like Facebook. I don't really like Facebook because they've killed all organic. Uh, you have to pay to play now on Facebook, which I don't really like at all. Snapchat really is just for teenagers. So if you have teenagers to young adults so if you have a podcast geared towards that niche then it might be useful to go on there but we don't really work with any podcasts that are geared towards that niche currently okay yeah we went crazy for a while and we got on like 70 different channels but what i noticed is there's a top uh, i don't know maybe like eight or ten that get us 95 percent of all our listens so that's right we were on all these channels and some of them i think weren't a good match you know, some are more like political, some are, you know, specializing, you said, for e-commerce, et cetera. Right. So even if you get on those channels, it doesn't do much. So, again, I've, I've noticed that there's a core group and I get a report, you know, every day of what listens we got from what channels. And very quickly, it's settled in to show like our top five or top eight channels. So hopefully that's helpful to other podcasters that, you know, they don't need to necessarily obsess and be everywhere. But one thing I don't like is when a podcast is only available on one channel, because I may not want to listen on CastBox or right. iTunes or whatever it is. What, what's your advice there? Right. So when I was talking, what I was mentioning earlier was social media channels. If we're talking podcasting channels specifically, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Overcast, iHeartRadio, Pandora, my opinion is you should be on as many channels as possible, even the ones that aren't a perfect fit for you, because you don't, that extra one or two downloads still counts towards your download numbers, right? It's, to me, it's a distribution play. The more places you are, the more visibility you have, period, even if your podcast doesn't fit on that platform. Now, just like you said, top eight to 10 platforms are really where 95% of your downloads come from. And if we're going to even lower that number down, I'd say it's, 60 to 65 percent of your downloads are probably coming from apple podcasts and spotify alone then the rest of the platforms come into play but it's a, it's really just a distribution play the more places you are the better it is and that's where social media channels come in into play as well mm. and what about uh reviews and likes or whatever a channel has to offer you know the different platforms again the youtube you got a whole bunch of stuff itunes has its own stuff how important are those kinds of things uh, every platform works a little bit differently, but they're always important no matter what platform it is. So with Apple specifically, the more reviews you have on your podcast and the more reviews you get in a short period of time, the higher it pushes you up the charts, which means the more visibility you get on Apple Podcasts and the more easily someone finds you on that platform. On YouTube, the more comments, the more likes, the more views that you get, the more the algorithm sees that people are enjoying your content and the more it shows similar types of people your content as well. Same goes with all the other social media channels. Spotify has reviews now as well, but they're not visible like the way Apple Podcasts are. So if someone leaves a review on Spotify, it might show up on their homepage of Spotify. Hey, there's there's more podcasts episodes from this specific publisher. Do you want to listen to them? Every platform out there that has a podcast on it or social media content from the podcast on it has their own way of kind of doing things. And then there's some platforms that don't, that don't have anything like that at all, like Ghana or Overcast or any one of these other smaller platforms that podcasts are on as well. Some of them are just for searching regions like Stitcher, for example, or Listen Notes, mm. right? 
What about people that uh, buy reviews or they buy, you know, 10,000 likes or 10,000 views? Good or bad idea in your experience? That's an interesting question. I think there's pros and cons to every one of your choices that you make in that realm, right? Let's say you buy followers on social media. On the plus side, it'll add credibility. On the negative side, with a trained eye, unless you're really good at keeping appearances, anyone will be able to tell that you bought followers and you lose credibility on the other side. I would say about 80% of people are untrained in that though, so you'll gain credibility with about 80% of people. Also, it can mess up your algorithm on some social media channels, or it will mess up your algorithm after it sees that you have fake followers or fake engagement. On the flip side of that, I know somebody now that uh, when I first met him, he had 600 followers on Instagram, and now he has 300,000 followers on Instagram. 99% of them bought, 99.9% of them bought, but now he has a verification badge, and he's a very well-known person in the Web3 space, right? All from bought followers. Buying reviews on Apple. Because it's something that a lot of sponsors have to be have to be very careful to watch out for. If you buy a lot of reviews on Apple, it can kind of look like your podcast gets more downloads than it actually does. And if your podcast gets more, if it looks like that, sponsors more readily give you their money. I mean, I know people that are that, or I don't know people, but I know you can. Being in this space as long as I have, start a podcast, probably run up your review numbers to a thousand reviews, and then. Make $5,000 a month from your podcast without really doing any extra work. Now, that's super unethical in my opinion, and but I, I'm not here to be a voice of good or bad, wrong or right. Mm. Just just what I've seen from what works and what human behavior seems to, or where human behavior seems to come into play with these situations, there's pros and cons to literally everything you do here. Yeah, right. I, I agree. I, I mean, you, I, you know? Yeah, I mean, you could, right, a sponsor could sue you for bad faith or misrepresenting your, your numbers. Some of the platforms, I'm sure, would kick you off if you're if you try to be too aggressive with this stuff. Right. You know, third of all, it's unethical. But there are some people that have used it to jumpstart their stuff. So I just wanted to lay it out for for people so they know the truth of it. It's not just sunshine and rainbows, but it's not just you know all bad either. But they have to make their own choice. It sounds like. Right. Okay. Well, bring it, Omar. Uh, so how can people reach you if they want your services? Look, you know, if you can lay out a few things that you do and then, uh, you know, what are some links people can have to, uh, to reach out to you? Uh, some links. So you can find me on my website, www.nomadscast.com. That's N-O-M-A-D-S-C-A-S-T.com. You can also email me at omar at nomadscast.com. Either one of those places. I also have a calendar link on my website where you can go down and book a call with me. So really any of those two places, feel free to reach out to me. And then the uh, services, you, do you have different levels of service or is it customized to the individual? Or you know, how would you characterize uh, what you do for people? It's, it's really, uh, you can put it in as a broad term of podcast marketing and content marketing. Really, we offer a lot of custom solutions for our clients, but the core offer always revolves around leveraging your podcast to grow your social media platforms, as well as using specific strategies to grow your podcast number for your audience. But we also do things like editing your podcast, transcribing it, booking you guests, getting you on other podcasts, getting you sponsorships, really just tailors to that specific person and what their needs are. Okay, well, very good. Well, Omar, thanks for coming on the podcast. And uh, I just want to tell listeners, like I said, uh, we use Omar for quite a while now. Uh, he has an excellent work ethic. I get an update every week, you know, by video. I ask him what else we can do. He comes up with ideas. So I highly recommend him because I have personal experience with him. So, um, you know, thank you, everyone. And Omar, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me on, RJ. Remember, before you go, to grab your one penny bag of pine pollen for all the amazing all-natural hormonal support that men and women the world over are raving about. Try it out and see how it works for you. All you have to do is head to GeniusPollen.com to grab your bag today. Within days, you may be able to notice greater energy, more focus, added recovery, and more. Again, please visit GeniusPollen.com to learn more now. Thank you. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.